Brown, thank you for being with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. So one of the, the way I usually start, of course, I start at the beginning when we talk about, um, you know, how you became a lawyer and so on. I want, and I want to do that. But I want to ask you something a little bit different to begin with. Um, you have a military background. I do. Uh, you're a graduate of the Naval Academy. Yes. Uh, you served uh, both in the Navy and in the Air Force. Uh, and I know we have a number of students who are veterans. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether that background had any effect on your choice of career, your choice of, or, or the way you practiced law or conducted yourself as a lawyer. I'd be delighted to answer that. Let me see, who, who's the veteran? Okay. Well, I, I, that is a part of my life. It was 10 years of my life, uh, five in the Navy and five in the Air Force. I grew up in a little town called Vienna down the road here. And that happened to be where Senator George, this, who this institution is named for, was from. And he told me if I joined the Navy, he would give me an appointment to the Navy. Okay. I joined the Navy, and he did, and I went. Four years later, I was graduated. There was no Air Force Academy at that time, so 10% of West Point and 10% of uh, Annapolis could join the Air Force if they wanted to. So I did. I became a navigator, and I flew on a B-52, uh, SAC, Strategic Air Command. I was stationed at Warner Robins most of the time. And I don't have any war stories to tell you about that, but I've got an event to tell you about <laughs> that didn't mark my life. And probably yours, too, you don't know it. It was October. 1962. Anybody know where I'm going? <laughs> we just happened to be stationed yeah. at Presque Isle, Maine, in our B-52. Uh, that aircraft at the time had four hydrogen bombs in Bombay. I see some acknowledgement in the audience. We had two atomic weapons that were missiles under the wings that we could pick off and go annihilate some people over here, annihilate some people over here. <laughs> And uh, our job at the time in the Cold War, it was, was to keep these planes up most of the time. So we flew these long missions, 42 hours sometimes. We'd go the great circle route from Warner Robins up over New York, out over the Atlantic. We'd get to uh, Spain. And a KC-135 would come up and we'd refuel. And then we'd circle the Mediterranean for two or three times. And we'd fly back, refuel, come home. 42 hours. But the event I wanted to tell you about, October 1962, the Russians wanted to put missiles in Cuba, as we said back then, Cuba, because that's the way the president pronounced it, down in Cuba. <laughs> they wanted to put missiles in the name of our cities. And John Fitzgerald Kennedy said, I don't want you to put those missiles down there. Don't do that, please. And the picture is this. We were on, on in the alert shack up in Maine watching it play out on television. And somehow they've got the picture of the Russian vessel bringing the missiles to Cuba. And we know the president is saying to Khrushchev, turn it around. And if you don't turn it around, we're going to blast it out of the water. And so they rang our bell. Now, our target wouldn't have been that ship. We had a target in Russia. We were going to go blast this city. So they said, get on the plane. We got on the plane. We taxi to the end of the runway. Five of us, five planes, ready to go. And we sat there for about 30 minutes. It dawned on me, this is Armageddon. <laughs> this is the end of the world. You know, all my life under them, I never took, I never took it seriously. I never thought we'd have a war. I said, if we take off and we're gonna do what we're supposed to do, this will be the end. We were supposed to fly to our target, do a maneuver like this and drop those hydrogen bombs. Turn right, they said, and fly to Egypt. See if you can find a landing field. This is how this was our escape route. Fly to Egypt, find a landing field, and see if they'll refuel you. If you get some more fuel, don't come back to the United States because it won't be here. 
fly to South America and see if you can make a life for yourself. More or less, that's what we were supposed to do. But at any rate, they called us down. I go back in and I watch the TV. And what happened was, we were supposed to win. Here's Kennedy, here's Khrushchev. And they told us Khrushchev blinked. And they had a picture of that ship turning 180 out of the Atlantic back to Russia. And we did not have World War III, but it had an, out, an impact on me as to what I think about war. It'll give you a certain perspective on the rest of your life. It, it does. It, uh, it kind of did this to me. I, everything settled down about it. And I just sort of felt like I was not a military person. I, you people that have been in the military, maybe you know what I mean. I just wasn't cut out for a command. I, didn't, I really didn't like to order people what to do. I find that right easy from the bench because all the rules were laid out for you. But in the military, you've got to do something different. I, I wasn't very good at it. So I was thinking about coming out of that. And I'm anxious to know if your experience in life is like this. Uh, I was to get out after five years. It was somewhere along about the fourth year. We land on the strip out here, Robin, to put off on the tarmac. And Glenn Mitchell, our pilot, says, Hardy, there's a general over there in the plane next to us that sent word over here and wants to interview you to see if you'd be his aide. I had to, that was it. I either had to go over there and interview you and take that job, and I would be committed to that general and to the Air Force, or I had to not do it. And it You've been there? If you haven't, you will be there. So, I mean, everybody gets to a place like that. But I said, man, tell him no. I never met the general. And so I got out of there for a moment in your life that turned it that to turned a different direction. And my life's been full of that kind of thing. If I can tell one more thing. Absolutely. So I said, what, what to do now? I'm not going to be a military person. What, what, what to do? So I talked to my wife. And she, helped advise me, but I, I decided to take a business law course that Mr. Harmon, a nice gentleman lawyer from this area, he was teaching an extension course in business law. Has anybody here ever had business law? Well, I'll, I'll probably love it. I'm glad. That course is what brought me to be a lawyer. And one moment in it, did it. One moment in that course. Mr. Harmon is talking to us about contracts, what it takes to make a contract. Y'all had contracts yet? Yes. All right. You know what a contract is. <laughs> the world out there does not know what a contract is. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know what a contract was, but Mr. Harmon said, let me explain about a contract. The law doesn't evaluate what one person does for another, what the consideration back and forth. It doesn't weigh that consideration, but the law requires that there be consideration. He says, Hardy? A peppercorn would be sufficient. I don't know if still teach that or not. A peppercorn. That hit me like a ton of bricks. It exploded in my head. I understand. I said, yes, that makes sense. <laughs> the law is not going to evaluate the deal we make, but it's going to require, it's going to require some consideration. And all it takes is a peppercorn. <laughs> So I went home and I said, Carolyn, what's a peppercorn? <laughs> she took me in the kitchen and showed me. <laughs> so I said, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be a lawyer. Well, you came to Mercer. Came to Mercer. Yes, I did. How did we do? And what did we do to prepare you? Oh, how did the uh, yeah, Mercer Law School? Oh, yes. I say we, I was very young. <laughs> well, y'all yeah, yeah, picked up with peppercorns. And you talked in some more detail about what a contract is. <laughs> and you talked to me something about criminal law. I like that subject. I think my favorite, and I don't believe it will be yours, was property law. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I feel that way? I understand the earth, but look. There's something about property law that tells you about all the law. To me, the history of it. You know, Professor Ray Bird talked to us about liberty of season. You go out on the ground, you pick up a clod of dirt, and I hand it to you in the face of the witnesses, and that means title has passed to you. Isn't that fantastic thought? <laughs> I had that happen later in my career. I've had a 
fellow who was a Mennonite over in Macon County, and he wanted to buy some land across the street. And we went to my office, we did all the papers and closed that out, and he said, now come with me. So our whole entourage goes out to the farm, his farm on one side of the road. He says, stand here and witness what I'm about to do. He gets on his tractor, drives across the road, sinks the um, harrow into the ground, makes a circle, comes back. He says, thank you, you can go now. But for him, that was title. That was the passing of title, like the clump of dirt, don't you see? Anyway, y'all taught me that. Mr. Rayburg told me that. Dean Quarles, did you know him? He, he was the dean of the law school when I was here. Taught uh, constitutional law? No, not yet. Not yet. Next. Look out. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, what he said to us, what Dean Quarles says, uh, we were talking about title. What is title to a car, to anything? What's title? And he says to us, I don't know. I'll talk to you about equal uh, uh, due process. Equal protection. Equal protection. <laughs> <laughs> the other one. <laughs> All you want to do is this. don't ask me what a title is. I don't know. And he was right. I mean, it is hard to know what a title is. But he told us uh, constitutional law, and we. I, I like that course a lot. You, you will be, you'll, you'll love it. Were you practiced law before you were on the bench for about 10, 11 years mm -hmm. before you became a spirit court judge? Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what kind of practice you had, the kinds of things that you did. Yes, I was a plaintiff's lawyer. We got plaintiffs and we got defendants on the civil side. I was a plaintiff's lawyer. We sued people. We sued the establishment. That was our job. Uh, and I had as a mentor, a man whose name has been mentioned here before because I watched some of the predecessors. Hank O'Neill was my mentor. He was the most accomplished lawyer who ever sat at council table, I can assure you. Just to illustrate it, we had a case. Our people were riding in a school bus. It's crossing the bridge over the Okmulgee River. And it was whacked from behind by this big truck. And the defense was, we couldn't see you because the bridge has got a hump in the middle of it. And sure enough, if you back off on the edge of the, go back up the highway, take a picture looking down the bridge, it looks like this. And the argument made sense, you know, and got scared as Hank said, well, let's, let's go down, Harley, get us a boat. Get you a boat. Let's go down. We got in a little old boat and rode up the river. Turn around and looked down at the bridge. I swear to you, it looks flat. You understand what I'm saying? It was perspective, how you looked at that. So he gets an architect to build an exact model of that bridge, exactly like it is. So we could put it in front of the jury. And when George Grant says, there's a hump in the bridge, and he's got a picture that shows one. We could say, there ain't no hump in the bridge. <laughs> and there's really not. You know, it's, it's just a, it's a, almost an illusion, the way you look at the hump. So I always said Hank took the hump out of the bridge and the defense from George Grant. And he won the case. It's amazing, he did. It's amazing how many people that come in here and talk with me talk about Hank O'Neill. Yes. He was an impressive personality, utterly uh, devoted to what he was doing. I, and I studied under him for five years. We would uh, close the front door at five o'clock at Adams O'Neill Law Firm. Adams, by the way, is the father of Bill Adams, who's coming here. To see. He was here last week. Oh, he was. All right, his father. It was Adams O'Neill Law Firm. We shut the front door. There were fourteen of us in there at five o'clock, and Hank would get his Canadian club, he loved Canadian club, he had several keys to go. He would wait till exactly five o'clock, and he would pour some Canadian club in a glass, and he had a drink back then called Goofy Grape. It was a great drink, and he would pour that in another glass, and he would take a 
<laughs> and after about 15, 20 minutes, <laughs> Frank became very congenial, conversant. <laughs> I mean, it's serious that we were talking about. It. That was about the time the Civil Practice Act was passed, 1967. And we would spend hours behind those closed doors with him drinking Canadian Club. And Goofy Gray. And Goofy Gray. <laughs> and if I had my life to live all over again, I would have joined him in all of that, but I didn't drink whiskey at the time. I changed my attitude about that. <laughs> <laughs> I highly recommend you a little snoring. Uh, uh, the thing about it was, the phones were cut off, the door was locked, Nobody could get in, nobody could get out. I went to a 10 o'clock that night. And we learned a lot. I played some tough. It wasn't fair to my wife and my family. So I left. Went back down to Vienna. Yeah, so you, you left practice in Bacon and went back home to Vienna. Right. The nature of the practice continued to be plaintiff's work? Yes, sir. Uh, in a little town, now you have to draw some deeds, wills, and divorce them too. You gotta make a living. You gotta do what you gotta do. You wanted in practice and saw that kind of work. How did it come about that you first became a judge? I was sitting in that office down there one day. This is another one of those things. I tell you, it happens that way. You got a few minutes to make up your life. <laughs> the phone rang. Roy McMurray, who was the local Superior Court judge had been appointed to the Court of Appeals, so there was a vacancy. But I didn't much about it. I'm sitting there trying to figure out how to win this case. The law truck is home for somebody. And the phone rings, and it's from Atlanta. He says, how'd you like to be the judge? I said, oh, I don't know. I hadn't thought about it. He said, uh, well, think about it. I said, okay. Now, I had the impression he was speaking to the governor. Turned out later he was not speaking to the governor. <laughs> He was just a lawyer up there in Atlanta who didn't want somebody else to have the job. <laughs> so he was trying to get me to take, uh, go after the job, you see. He says, uh, I said, well, how long do I have to think about this? He said, oh, take a couple of hours. <laughs> so I did. I went home, talked to Carolyn, went across the street to the Bible Methodist Church, got on my knees for a few minutes, went back into the office, told my partner I was going to take this job. And I did. That wound up in an election for and 30 days later I had to run to that office. Okay. Talk a little bit about that transition from practice to, to being a judge. I mean, how did your perspective on things change once you got the road on and were up there on the bench? Yeah, yeah that's, that's a, right on. So you're a lawyer, you're an advocate, and the next day you know they put a robe on you and say, you're now a judge. And you're sitting there, and this is what got me. These lawyers would come in and make their arguments to the court. And I would listen to them and I would say, my God, I don't understand that. You know, it'd be some esoteric thing about law I didn't know. I, I thought, well, I keep talking, keep talking, you know. And I, I said, I don't know if I can handle this job. These guys are... About six months I did it that way and just fretted over it. And then I thought, well, I'll just ask them some questions. And I started asking questions. I mean, just simple questions. And I found out they didn't know what the hell they were talking about either. <laughs> <laughs> so that let us start from the beginning. Nobody in here. You remember what Plato said in his academy? Nobody here speaks the truth. We all seek it together. Well, that's a splendid attitude in the court. Everybody here speaks, seeks it. We don't know what it is. Let's seek it together. So that was uh, something I learned. What did you like about being a trial judge in particular? We're going to talk about the Supreme Court in a minute, but about being a trial judge. Right? I didn't like it very much. <laughs> Why? Well, <laughs> it, I'm just sick of that question. I, I asked them that question a lot. Tell me why. Well, you sit there by yourself, and you have to make decisions about other people's <coughs> lives, and you don't really know what you're doing. 
you know, you're always glad we find a rule of law that says you must do this. But so much of the time you can make do this or you can do that. And if you, that just was not fun <coughs> to, to do that. Just the weight of the responsibility mm -hmm. and the uncertainty about whether you were doing it or not. What you were doing or not. And the nice thing about going to uh, the Supreme Court was I no longer had to do that by myself. Uh, all, uh, there were seven of us on the court. And so we make decisions together. It took four votes to make a decision. But you had to, at least three people supporting you in the decision. And that's easier. How did it come about that you went from the Superior Court to the Supreme Court? Let's talk about that. Probably. Another one of those phone calls at the dead of the night. <laughs> How'd you like to be on the Supreme Court? Well, okay. <laughs> so, off I go on my point. George Busby was the uh, governor. He's also from Vianna, by the way. Senator George and George Busby are from Vianna. He impacted my life a lot, both of them. But it's about, I'm going to appoint you to the Supreme Court. Okay. So I go up there and take an oath, and everybody claps and start. You're on a plea and all that stuff. I get in my office there after just a few weeks. I'm sitting there late in the afternoon. Three people walk in, three ladies. And they have these papers. I thought they were bringing, you know, a case from the clerk's office for me to review and decide or something. So they hand me the papers, but I looked at them and, my God, they under defended. The suit against me. <laughs> so. What they said was, your appointment was it's not valid because your predecessor resigned at a time when there should have been a special election and there shouldn't have been an appointment. And I said, oh my goodness, that's a mess. I've already given up my life in Vienna and come up here in the middle. Well, so we go to court in a federal district court and the judge agreed with it that this appointment's no good. And so you're going to have to have a special election. And I mean, I, I just sank. And uh, we did it, We had a special election. And uh, I won. And then they go back into court and say, that election is no good. What wrong with it? <laughs> what wrong with it was, you were identified as the incumbent. You weren't the incumbent. And nobody knew whether I was the incumbent or not, really. But the judge said, no, you, you can't be, you weren't the incumbent. And that question, you can see how that question came. But listen, I was before a federal district judge who said, your appointment's no good. But in my order, I'm going to let you serve on. I will let you continue to serve, even though your appointment's no good. And I want to ask you, by what authority? Did a federal judge appoint me to the Supreme Court of Georgia? I don't know, but he went to the Eleventh Circuit and they said he's right. <laughs> Arthur Bolton said, I'm going to give you the best lawyer I got to represent you. And Mike Bowers, some of you might know Mike Bowers, was the Attorney General well, assistant. He took the case to go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court of the United States granted social record. They wanted to look at the question of federalism. I, I think. And it wasn't totally clear what they were going to look at, but I think they wanted to know how a federal district judge could appoint a Supreme Court justice in the state. But by then, the regular election, two years had gone by, the regular election came along, and I won again. And somebody told the Supreme Court that I'd won, they said, well, it's moot now, we'll just dismiss the case. Well, that's not the most direct version. While we're talking about um, elections. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I do want to talk to you about your, your, your actual work on the court, but whether judges should be elected is and has been for a long time is a very hot issue. And I know you have a particular perspective on this because you had to campaign. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about your your politics, uh, yeah. you know, a, as a judge and, and, and what that what that did for you. That was like the discipline you received when you were a young child. That was the best thing that ever happened to me in that regard. And this is why. 
here I am, a big shot Supreme Court justice running for office. And I'm riding around Georgia asking people to vote. So like everybody else, one night I wound up in front of the Lions Club in Albany, Georgia, 7 o'clock at night. I make my speech while I ought to continue to be the justice. And this fellow was sitting right, right where you are. I'm, I'm right here. He, he's right over there. I'm up. And he, uh, he's right there. And he, he comes up to me like this. He says, I want to ask you something. <laughs> Nobody had done that to me in a while, you know? <laughs> I want to ask you something. How come is it? When I go down to the courthouse, the judge says, we do this in my court. But we don't do that in my court. Let me tell you something. Those are our courts. <laughs> you know what I said? Yes, sir. <laughs> I think that's a lesson that every judge ought to learn somehow. These courts don't belong to the judges. And they don't belong to the legislature. And they don't belong to the government. They belong to you. You're going to have a job, you're going to be a lawyer. You'll have a special role in those courts, but you don't own them either. If you think you do, go down to the Lions Club. <laughs> <laughs> Were you different after that as a judge? Yes, sir. Talk about it. Okay, well, you think about it. The governor appoints you, or the president appoints you to a federal job. You feel some obligation. You can't help but feel some obligation. If you're human, to that person, and you don't want to disappoint them. Now you hope all you have to do is do right. But there'll come a case with that governor or that president involved in it. And what are you going to do? What are you going to feel and think and do about that situation? But if you know these people are on these courtrooms, I don't work for them. I don't work for them. I don't work for the governor. It was clear to me that I no longer work for the governor. I guess I did the first little bit. But after that event, I knew I didn't work for the governor. I worked for these people. So I've got to look at this case as what's in their interest as it, as it affects this case. It changes things. Thank you. Talked a minute ago about one of the things that you liked about the appellate work was that you had company uh, in making these decisions. Yeah, talk a little bit more about how different it is being on the appellate court versus the trial court, and what you liked about it, and if there was anything that frustrated you uh, or you didn't like about it. Talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, when I first sat down on that court, there were seven of us up there, and I, I was intimidated, honestly. Uh, I didn't. Uh, feel adequate to the job, and I wasn't sure of myself. So I just sat there and I listened for six months to the lawyers and some of the judges asked questions at all, but I was a little afraid to ask questions. And Chief Judge Bob Jordan came to me in the hall one day and said, Hardy, it'll be all right if you ask questions. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> so I started asking questions and it started being fun again to ask questions and have some back and forth with these lawyers out there who know a lot about it. That was fun. So one day, Saturday morning, we get a case, special emergency. There is a woman in the hospital about to have a baby any minute now. The doctor assures the local judge, and it comes up to us, that if she does not have a cesarean section, the child will die. And she will probably. And we need an order. And they, the family, one tenet of their faith was, we do not do blood transfusions. We do not believe in it. It's a matter of our faith. And we're not going to have this blood transfusion. And the father says to the judge and the sheriff and everybody down there, God will provide. That's what he said. So they come up to us. I hope they went to God, too, because coming to us was a long way from that. But we looked at it and thought about it on one Saturday morning. And we know it's about to happen. And we decided that the state has an interest in this unborn child that's sufficient to overcome this, this belief. 
And with fear and trembling, we wrote a per curiam that is nobody signed. A per curiam opinion saying, trial judge tell the sheriff to go in there and order the transfusion, order the doctors to close. He said, we go home, sit around. At least we were all together. Everybody agreed on the court. There was seven of them. The next day, guess what we read in the paper? The child was born by natural birth. God provided. <laughs> 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 I said, give up. Why would we do? We spent all day Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> give the home a definition of nursing. <laughs> but you know, the comfort in that was that it was so much easier, it was hard to make a decision about things like that. But it was easier to do it with seven people than it was with one person. What were the hardest kinds of cases? Death penalty cases, or other kinds of, what were the, the ones that when they came to your desk, you thought, oh boy, here we go again. Well, if, may I ask you a question? May, may I ask the professor a question? <laughs> what do you mean by hard? Um, we'll hold it. We'll stall this a while. <laughs> You'll be thinking about that too. Um, troubling. You think so? Hard is troubling. You know, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's what you mean. And you're asking the question. So <laughs> troubling. I think you probably it's it's things like the one I just described or or death penalty cases where you, human lives are involved. But, but if you want to say hard is where it takes a lot of mental effort. Okay, let's go there. You want to go there? Let's go there. <laughs> okay. Contracts. Peppercorns. <laughs> Peppercorns. <laughs> yeah. Contracts. I really think I really think the most difficult are these arcane statutes that are passed by the legislature on various subjects, and trying to figure out what they mean, and how to construe them. How to, how do you construe this statute? What do these words mean? What does hard mean? Did you know that there are 800 meanings of the word run? There are 800 meanings. So you're there on the court trying to figure out what run means. And you look at the, go to the dictionary and 800 meanings of run. Think about it, Louis, and they'll come to you. And, uh, Another one that, that I liked was, uh, well, it won't come to me now, but there's so many words that have more than one meaning, and it's very difficult to know what the legislature intended in this particular statute. What you try to do is look at the context. Check. That was the word, check. A check can be a little thing you send through the mail, right? A check can be a minor investigation into a minor, can it? A check, there's one other meaning, it won't come to me right now for check, so you have to look and see. But if, if the text is, we mailed the check on Monday, you know what it is. We went by and checked the pressure in the tires. You know what you did, it's the context. So you learn how to do that. Those are hard cases to me. Was there ever a time when you had a case where the law seemed to send you in one direction, but justice in your mind was something else. I wish you hadn't asked me that, because that's hard. <laughs> but you did. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Would you mind talking? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was trying to think of an example. I didn't, I didn't come to you with an example in my mind of uh, where you feel like Mercy, well, mercy and justice, right? Which would you rather have? Let me tell you which you'd rather have. <laughs> you always want mercy. <laughs> justice can be tough. And what is justice? And if you're looking at a, a rule, what, you know, a good example of that is these uh, mandatory uh, penalties for drug stuff in the, in the federal system. Uh, I guess we have it in Georgia, I don't know. Mandatory minimum sentences. So
So you're the judge and somebody's before you and they plead guilty. If you, and you've got to sentence them to 20 years in the penitentiary. 20 years. And you want to say, wait a minute, this is, this doesn't call for 20 years. I mean, this is bad. We've got to stop this stuff. But not 20 years, not this the rest of their life. And, uh, but your hands are tied, you say, because I, he, so that would lead you to try to find the person not guilty. Which is not honest either, is it? If he says he's guilty, I mean, if he is guilty. So there's a lot of cases like that where it's just hard to know, uh, hard to decide. You know, we have equity. You know what equity is? Yes, sir. I always thought that equity is something that's in, built into the, one way to think of equity is it's something built into the law that gives you a little leeway. That's kind of what it is, isn't it? Uh, a judge who's sitting in equity. Have y'all studied equity? Well, y'all in for a great time. Equity <laughs> is going to give you a thrill when you learn what equity is. But we'll leave it at that now. I have a lot of questions, but one I want to make sure I ask before we turn it to the students. I've got two I want to make sure I ask. Here's the first one. You left the bench 1990 and then in private practice again since then. So you have been a lawyer or a judge since 1966. How has law practice changed in in that span of time? What are big changes you see? Uh, well, let me just before I went on the bench, I had a practice in plaintiff's practice, and afterwards I did. There were two different worlds to me, almost. One one is because of the and proliferation of cases, I mean, just everywhere, and different sorts of statutes you have to deal with and, and come to understand. Uh, but I, had, I don't know if this is quite in point with your question, but this is what I want to tell them. The experience I had in leaving the bench, when, you, when you're on the bench, and people come to you and say, Your Honor, please, and they open the door for you, and, they, and if you ever start to believe that's real, you're in trouble. <laughs> You've got to understand that belongs to the office and not you. If you think that's your prerogative, and this is the way I was taught. I, got, I leave the court, and I get in my first case, and I'm talking to the lawyer on the other side, and I say to him, this is what I think. And he says to me, you're crazy as hell. <laughs> said, thank you, I'm back in the law practice. <laughs> you don't say that to the judge, you know. <laughs> not if you want to. So you, there's just a whole different world, and I like I like being the lawyer. That's more fun. That's just more fun. Uh, that's all I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> you got to ask me another question. <laughs> all right, here's another open-ended question for you. These are this is the entire first year class, and we have all the transfer students as well. <coughs> they have to be here. Yeah. I wouldn't have been here either. <laughs> 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 you got <laughs> <laughs> I don't have authority to order. You do either. Um, what advice do you have for them? I mean, is, is there anything? Is there anything maybe you wish somebody had said to you when you were a law student? Yeah. Uh, that you think that they should hear from your perspective of decades as a lawyer. Yeah, I would like to say all this. Here you are beginning your legal career. And I've seen so many people in your spot and then graduation and then pass the bar. And you get into a job that you don't like. If you get into a job you don't like, quit and get you another job because there's so many things you can do as a lawyer that why live a miserable life when you can have a wonderful life? It might be for you, weighing peppercorn is what you need to do. <laughs> for me, it was the courtroom. I just like to be in the courtroom. You might like that. But just a, so many things you can do. So don't be unhappy as a lawyer. Change your job. Okay. Good advice. All right, I've got a lot more questions. I'm going to see what questions the students have. 
Questions we have for Justice Gregory this morning? What they're thinking about is that test next. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, you said that when you started out with uh, Adams and O'Neill, that um, that time that you spent learning the law came at the expense of your family. Um, personal question: uh, You know, how, how did? What do you think that that did? What do you think that that exchange really cost you with your family? I had a son who was diabetic on age two. He would have insulin reactions. I don't know if anybody's familiar with diabetes, but I have it too. Uh, he was just a child at the time, maybe four years old. He'd have these insulin reactions and he would just pass out. So I'm in the car. We had a car. One car. And I go down to their office, and I'm in there behind those doors that are locked, and the telephone is disconnected. And Greg has an insulin reaction at home. And he's got to get to the emergency room right now. Carolyn can't call me. Thank goodness Thatcher Watson was next door. Aware of the situation, he gets Carolyn and Greg and off to the hospital they go. I come home at 10.30 that night. They're back home. And there's Carolyn. I have to look her in the eye. And I could not do that very well. She told me what had happened. So I changed that. I left. I don't want to live like that. I don't think it's worth it. I, when I went on the Supreme Court, I told everybody around me, if Carolyn or Greg or Liz, that's my family, if one of them calls you and we're in the middle of the biggest case in the world, you come get me. And I will speak to them. And what you do with your family is you tell them that. You have access to me anytime and mean it. So you can leave. Who's going to stop you? You're free. Just get up and walk out of the courtroom and speak to your family. That's what I would do. That's what I. That's what I learned in, in that. Thank you. 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 Legal writing is that what the tip of the legal, legal research is legal what's research. on their mind. <laughs> well, you go to the index and you look down the index. <laughs> challenge anybody about their faith. I, mean, I have a faith. But I'll leave, I won't discuss that in that way. But here's what I would suggest. This is what I can tell you. Uh, when you become a lawyer, you will not change who you are. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Whatever you bring to that will be what that lawyer is. If you go on the bench and become a judge, you're going to bring all that stuff. But there is no way. If you, there is no way for you to be totally objective. You're going to be subjective sometimes because you are a subject. You can't help it. You know, people ask that question about judges all the time. But how can you uh, not have feelings about this? Or how can you dis? How can you disassociate yourself from your past? You were a Democrat, you were a Republican, you were a Trump or a something. You can Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned, I guess, uh, the first time you got a call about a judgeship that 
I guess the guy wanted you over some other person who was running for that position. So uh, my question would be, would you say that politics play a certain role in terms of, you know, attaining a judgeship? And if so, do you feel that it may interfere with your ability to make, again, like you said, make the court about the people and not, you know, your court or the governor's court or anything like that? That's a great question. And it's right on. And the answer is, politics has everything to do with taking judges, both in the federal system and the state system. Whether you run for office or you're appointed, politics Listen, well, what we're doing right now is politics, right? You, you can't take politics out of the world. And you, your question is more pointed than that, though. Yes, if you're a judge, if you want to be a judge, you're a lawyer, and you want to be a judge, and you're in a, uh, you want to be a federal judge, let's say, well, you're not going to run for office because those, that's not how you feel. You're going to try to get the president to appoint you, right? That probably means you want to get senators in your state to say something to the president, right? Is that politics? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's what you have to do, but is that wrong? Here's what I would ask somebody. Tell me a better way. <laughs> the Missouri plan is this. First, a person is selected by merit. Now, who's going to decide merit, okay? You want to be meritorious people. Hogwash. <laughs> but anyway, that's the theory. You pick meritorious people and put them on the bench by appointment of the governor or somebody, and they serve for two years, and then they run for that office based on the record they established in those two years. That sounds good. It doesn't work, but it sounds good. It doesn't work entirely. Nobody knows the answer. If you'll come up to it with an answer for that that's really perfect, you would have made your record on this planet. <laughs> Other questions? Um, you said you were or are a plaintiff's attorney. I was wondering what um, appealed to you more about being a plaintiff's attorney than a defendant's attorney. And, and if, could I add one thing to this? Mm -hmm. and, and also, if you could talk a little bit about why you left the court and went back into practice. And you said that that's what you prefer, that's the life that you so if you talk a little bit about your career choices, plaintiff side, and then practice versus bench. Yeah. Uh, let's see, state your question again. I'm not sure I answered. Um, what appealed to you more about being a plaintiff's attorney than a defendant's attorney? It's something like this. If you're a defense lawyer, and on the civil side, now I'm, I'm not talking about criminal law, but if on, in, on the civil side of the court, if you're a defense lawyer, you have to keep time records and report to somebody that you worked so many hours on this case. I hate time records. <laughs> That's one reason. If you're working for a plaintiff, your time is yours. It's free. You can work all you want to. On it. You don't report to anybody because you're not going to be paid that way. You'll be paid based on a contingent fee. What you've got to do is win. Isn't that kind of fun? Uh, yeah, to me it is. It's uh, it's a little bit like gambling. <laughs> so you, you know, risk taking. And in order to get the case going, somebody has to put up the money, the finances. Roy usually does. You got all kind of ethical questions about that. So it's supposedly advancing the money to pay for it. And experts cost a lot of money, and you know the system. You, you can spend a lot of money on playing this case and then lose it, and somebody's just out. On the other hand, you can get a class action. <laughs> <laughs> Let me recommend to all of you, on the plaintiff spirit, get you a class action. <laughs> You've got all the advantages of representing the plaintiff. Plus the potential you be lit at the end. <laughs> that will cause your juices to run. <laughs> your family will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is index and class actions. <laughs>
traits or behaviors that you see in either young lawyers or lawyers in general that just rub you the wrong way? Can I apply that to everybody I know? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, especially judges. <laughs> there are two great illnesses for judges. One is arrogance. Another is ignorance. But the greatest of these is arrogance. You'll understand what I'm saying one day. <laughs> now for a law student, I mean, you're not, I mean, a young lawyer, you, you're asking a different kind of question. I think that applies. You can be, stand in front of the court and be cocky. Or, or write uh, briefs that say, such and such is disingenuous. Don't ever use it. <laughs> Don't use this. It's been overused. Or you might you write snippy things about your opponent. Don't do that. The court doesn't want to hear that. Just address the issues, you know. Don't uh, make it personal. And when this is what Hank told me, you're in the courtroom, trial court, and uh, you're you're speaking to the judge. Bye 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 bye. <laughs> and your opponent gets up. With the moment your opponent gets up, sit down. And your opponent's got to know what to do next. I mean, don't get into an argument with him, you see. Don't, don't give him any ammunition. Just stand there and look at him. Squirm. Let him squirm. It's fun. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, well, first, I enjoyed you very much today. <laughs> um, George, you, you, all of you. <laughs> um, my question is, when you said you were a trial judge and those dilemmas that you had to face alone, <coughs> you had to make decisions about people's lives, essentially, what moved you when there wasn't a clear-cut rule to help you decide to either be lenient or not? Like, how did you make that decision? Yeah, that's part of the question I asked over here. What did you bring to the bench? You know, what? who were you? Who was I? And I'm always saying. So I, you bring that to the bench, and that impacts how you make those kinds of decisions. Uh, some people are just naturally lenient. Some people are just naturally, what's the opposite of lenient? Severe. Severe. <laughs> they, uh, you know, I watch judges. People love to have the judge stand up there and just chew the defendant out. You, low life, blah, blah, blah. You're going to the penitentiary forever. Blah, blah, blah. That's absurd. Here's a judge who has all the power of the state or federal government behind him. All the judge ought to do is, I hear about soon as you. Just hold it. Now take a moment to share. Don't make, I mean, these lectures, these, uh, these, and it feels good to do that. You know, it feels good because everybody's with you. They're all mad with this guy. That's not the judge's job. I mean, just, I, too many. Don't do it. Just pronounce judgment and leave. So, how do you decide whether to be lenient or strict? Which of you? She said it depends on the circumstances, and it does for me. <coughs> sure. All right, maybe one more. <clears throat> this is the last question that will ever be asked <laughs> in this event here. So, who dares ask the last question? <laughs> Stand up to ask it. <laughs> and it must be profound. <laughs> All right, here it is. Stand up. Uh, wait now, wait, wait. We're about to hear the most profound <laughs> question ever asked in a setting of this sort. Uh, in your time on the bench, right, uh, I'm assuming that you got the opportunity to select your own chair. Right? The chair that you sat in behind, on the bench. Right? What options did you go with? What's, what's, <laughs> I 
think I'll give him the answer he deserves. <laughs> a nice, fat, soft one. <laughs> Thank you.